We've talked about dreams under management, goals under management, and now it's time for humans under management. More specifically, the virtual Humans Under Management Conference happening on the 8th of September with incredible speakers from around the world. I'm thrilled to be part of this event for those seeking better client outcomes, which as a listener of the Innovating Advice Show, I know includes you, and I'm impressed by how affordable this event is for advisors and planners everywhere. We're talking about the cost of a dinner. These super early bird tickets have sold out, but hop on now to grab an early bird ticket at innovatingadvice.com slash H-U-M for humans under management. The whole reason why we're in business, Kate, is because humans are not born with an expiry date. Uh, And people don't know how long they're going to live, which basically means they need to take out insurance and they need to invest correctly. The whole dying too soon and living too long is the whole reason why there is this personal finance investing world. If people were born with an expiry date, we could tell them to the nearest dollar what they could spend every day. So that's quite an interesting one. It takes a while for financial advisors to realize that. The whole reason why we're in business is because people don't know when they're going to die. They don't know if they're going to die too soon or they're they're going to die too late. Welcome to episode 57 of the Innovating Advice Show. I'm joined by Andy Hart, founder of Maven Advisor in the UK and the Humans Under Management Behavioral Finance Conference. In this episode, Andy shares what humans under management means, how the humans under management events came about, and we chat about this year's virtual event happening on the 8th of September with great speakers from around the world. We also chat about what behavioral finance means, what it looks like in practice, and how it ties into those humans under management. And Andy shares why he thinks everyone should call themselves a financial advisor, even if they fancy themselves a coach, planner, lifestyle advisor, wealth manager, or a myriad of other titles. Links, show notes, and timestamps at innovatingadvice.com or directly through the link below. You're listening to The Innovating Advice Show, and I'm your host, Kate Holmes, bringing you the global pulse on financial services innovation, featuring financial planners, financial advisors, and related professionals from all corners of the globe. Let's dive in. Hi, Andy. Welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome, and I'm super excited for our conversation and for the virtual Humans Under Management event happening on the 8th of September. Listeners have heard promos for that over the last few weeks. It's coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'm super thrilled to be part of it. I'm so excited for the whole lineup of everything that's happening, and I know it's a ton of work to take this in-person thing and turn it virtual, but let's start with what does Humans Under Management management mean? I think my work's done. I mean, you've done, you've done <laughs> a superb job before I've even said a, said a word really. So thank you very much for that. It really is appreciated. You are, you are speaking and we, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super, super grateful for you doing that. Um, yeah, so humans under management, um, basically what does it mean? I mean, this is a, a show for professional advisors. So I'm, I'm assuming most people talk about AUM, which stands for assets under management. Uh, but looking after money is, uh, you know, dreadfully easy. Um, you know, managing money is, as I say, it's uh, it's ridiculously easy once you've once you've learned it, learned a lot of it, learned as much as you can about investment management, and then the key is to unlearn ninety nine percent of it, and then yes. you're left with the essence, basically, which is global equities beat everything else, uh, and you know, volatility is baked into them, and the perfect, you know. Uh, you know, to, to summarize investment management in a sentence, it's globally well diversified equities and bonds, ideally more equities, and then it sort of move on as such. Um, but people sort of claim that investment management is hard and, you know, it's really challenging. And, um, you know, but as I say, once you've been in the business for a while, you realize that uh, investment management is dreadfully easy, but incredibly important. You know, it's the funding vehicle for the financial plan. Um, But the real challenge is managing the owners of the money. That's where all of our sort of problems are going to come from. You know, you don't get a sort of frantic email from a pension. You don't get a sort of frantic text message from an investment account. It's always the owner of the account um, that obviously, you know, is going to give you the sort of uh, frantic email. So, yeah, it's just a play on words. Most people talk about assets under management, AUM. And I was just thinking one day, the assets are sort of the easy part. All of my challenges, my, you know, focus is on the sort of owners of the money, so the humans. So then... Yeah, I just thought of the name uh, humans uh, under management. Uh, and when it comes to specifically investment management, 
I've found, and the sort of joke is with clients that, you know, on day one, we're going to set you up a, you know, perfectly historically appropriate investment portfolio on day one. Uh, the next 10,000 days of our relationship, I need to ensure that you leave it alone. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, yeah. it, it's staggering it's day one the investment portfolio set up correctly for the rest of our days together let's just call it 10,000 days I'm going to spend the rest of the 9,999 days ensuring you leave it alone and don't blow it up um, hence we manage the, the owners of the money uh, the money looks after itself once the owners sort of control their behavior so yeah that's a, a long answer to to the name humans under management and um, yeah that's basically where it's come from I like it so you came up with this humans under management. I love that. It's so pertinent to everything we're going to be talking about today as well. And then how did the events come about? You've been doing these for a few years and in multiple places around the world. Yes. So uh, initially I thought, um, yeah, I came to the conclusion that it's all about sort of managing the owners of the money, hence the sort of play on words, asset under manage assets under management. I came up with then humans under management. And then I was like, what am I going to do with the name? I've got sort of got the name. I'm into this sort of thing called behavioral finance. It's sort of a total new world for me. It's like a been, been a bit of a sort of light bulb moment in my career. Cause you come into the business thinking that you manage money, you focus on the money and then all of a sudden, all of your challenges and issues are going to come from the owners of the money. And then you have a bit of a realization as a professional advisor and think, actually, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a people business. This is not a money business. Um, and then you sort of change your focus and you realize you're, you're in the human nature business. Uh, like yourself, Kate, I probably attended lots of conferences, you know, uh, any given day, uh, po post COVID, pre COVID, whatever you want to call it in, in normal, normal times, yeah. there is hundreds of conferences around the world. Um, and there's obviously hundreds of conferences around sort of personal finance and money and specifically investing. And, uh, for my sins, I used to go to a lot of these conferences and, uh, let's say there was 10 speakers on the day. Um, I would probably say maybe eight of them were doing what I call lying from the stage. Um, they were talking about investments. There was a shed load of hindsight. There was a shed load of guesstimates a shed load of graphs uh, that, you know, they, they, they looked the part, they sounded the part, but as I say, they were doing what I call lying from the stage. And then maybe one of the speakers was talking about marketing, which I found, you know, really interesting. And then a final sort of token speaker of the day was talking about sort of behavioral finance or behavioral science or behavioral economics. And that was just by a country mile, the most interesting talk of the day. So I sort of flipped it on its head as such. And I thought, well, most people preferred the sort of talk at the end of the day that's about behavioral finance. The other ones I just sort of got through and they were quite painful. And I just thought, well, why don't I just put on a conference that is fully dedicated to the interesting stuff, uh, behavioral finance, behavioral economics, um, and sort of marketing. Um, and that's a conference that I wanted to attend. Uh, so I probably had to, you know, go to a lot of conferences to realize, you know, what I liked. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty sort of, uh, entrepreneurial and I can sort of come up with new ideas and sort of ship ideas as sort of Seth Godin says. Um, and I just thought, yep, yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a crack. Quite a few people in the UK were sort of putting on independent conferences, whereas previously before that it used to be sort of large asset managers, insurance companies. Um, so yeah, a few of the early adopters or sort of, uh, people that did it for the first time sort of paved the way. Um, which is quite interesting. There's quite a few independent conferences that I see emerging in the UK and they seem to be the ones that advisors prefer because they're sort of conferences by advisors for advisors. Uh, they're usually the ones that the ticket that there's, there's tickets and they're paid for, which again is great. You yeah. know, do you want to go to a free event and just be sold to, or do you want to pay a few quid and see great speakers? Uh, so again, I just thought that's exactly what I would want. And the sort of advisors that I sort of know well also sort of, uh, wanted that. So then, uh, yeah, that's how the sort of, uh, event event came along. And it's such a breath of fresh air. I have seen a few of the videos from prior events and like you say, those topics are so much more impactful. It got me super excited. I've been in audiences at those conferences you were mentioning of, you know, kind of lying from the stage. And I have to say one of my funniest memories was of one of the largest conferences here in the US back in, it was actually the week Lehman Brothers crashed. So then everybody was distracted and just hanging around the TVs. <laughs> on their phones. But, <laughs> on their phones, yeah. exactly. But I was taking pictures of how many people were just sleeping in the audience oh, of all these breakout wow. sessions because the speakers, it was just those charts and graphs and uh, not, not exciting. So what have been some of your most memorable speakers and topics over the last couple of years of doing the humans under management event 
just just on that running sort of conferences around the world i've run it in south africa predominantly in london and also in ireland um and the irish market's very unique um that they do sort of uh speak with their feet at conferences um so it's very common in an irish conference for people to leave at the first break definitely leave at lunch loads of them leave in the afternoon break so an Irish conference, an average Irish conference that has 50% of attendees at the end of the day is like a rock star conference. So oh, I've wow. been told and so I've experienced. And I think at the Human Side of Management one we did in 2018, I think there was, there was, there was almost the bulk of the people that registered in the morning there in the, uh, in the evening. So before awesome. even anyone was saying, let's wait for the feedback, everyone's saying that was that's definitely the best conference of the year, Andy. Look, everyone's still here. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas we don't really do that in the UK. We're quite polite. Um, we, if we sneak off, we're like very apologetic. I'm sorry. I really, I really, you know, like the house is on fire. The kids are, <laughs> you know, on the roof. I have to leave. I can't sit through the next three hours of that pain anymore. Um, so, yeah, that's quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, yeah. Um, so memorable speakers, did you say? Yes. Yeah, there's quite a few. Um, what we try and do is we try and mix it up with we have half sort of professional, sorry, half practicing financial advisors and then we have half sort of experts so, so it's a good sort, sort of mix some people love hearing from their peers and other people are like oh, i'm just bored hearing from my peers i want to hear from the experts it's trying to find that sort of uh, right balance um a couple of ones that spring to mind uh, i thought anthony villas uh from first wealth talk was quite good um he was sort of drilling quite deeply into sort of behavioral finance behavioral science and becoming quite a student of it and then he had like a like a lifestyle trade-off decision to make with him and his wife where they were deciding whether or not to sort of move out of London or not. And it's, uh, it's hilarious that it's that sort of clash between the sort of spreadsheet and the reality. You know, what makes sense on the spreadsheet doesn't make sense in the heat of a conversation. Um, and his wife was very much like, we're leaving, <laughs> we're leaving London, here's the reasons. We don't care if you've got some loss aversion or some anchoring towards London. Pride. You know, he came out of all this sort of very uh, intellectual sort of highbrow behavioral finance stuff and his wife's like no we're leaving i found the house and it's like <laughs> that clash of you know the the sort of theory with the practical um but that's actually something that's uh, quite quite an interesting point a lot of stuff makes sense on a spreadsheet that you know yeah. when you have a conversation with people it just sort of unravels isn't it um, i say sort of good decisions can be made on spreadsheets but not great decisions you know the great decisions just are just clear you don't need to crunch the numbers on it whereas the good decisions are a little bit sort of uh, you know in between uh, we've also had um abraham mocansanio speak um he's a sort of good friend of mine very passionate high on life um yeah just brings a lot of energy to all of his talks um he talked about one about how to prepare prepare for the next stock market crash i think it was about two years ago which is obviously we've gone through that in 2020 um he tells it straight pulls no punches um he couldn't give it really a monkeys about what people think he's a data guy so he just crunches the numbers and says you know here's what i found um there was also uh david jones from dimensional fund advisors he did a great talk about the sort of comparing patent applications so basically new innovation you know the amount of patent applications that have been submitted um sort of over the decades versus the sort of uh, innovation human progress and the sort of stock market performance uh -huh. so the more patent applications there are the more you know growth and innovation we see which is sort of obvious to sort of hear that now but seeing it on on the chart was quite uh quite um sort of eye-opening really um rob kaplan from first wealth again he's sort of anthony's sort of partner he did a great talk a very very personal about his sort of a sort of medical story and then the, how that fits within his business um moira summers did a great talk she's got a brilliant book um advice that sticks um she yes. was the sort of keynote last year um yeah brilliant unique insights just from you know her profession and stuff and the sort of correlation between uh you know why why people can't you know, follow advice, why people can't take advice, why can't pe people implement things in, in, in the sort of comparison to the sort of medical world versus the sort of finance, because they're both sort of sort of high ticket items. Um, and finally, uh, Nick Lincoln, who's a bit of a polarizing character, who's a great advisor and, and brings a sort of unique spin to, to, to the event. Um, as I say, he's polarizing and some people think his talks are a little bit, uh, a little bit off, but weirdly he always wins best speaker. So <laughs> this is, this is a challenging thing, isn't it? It's that whole, um, the audience are a bit like, oof, this guy's a 
pushing it a bit, but then when it's in the uh, you know the quiet of their own their own iPhone, they 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 give a good score. Um, so yeah, it's quite funny running a sort of conference about behavioural finance because we've got to do things which are also behavioural financey, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, like we've got to do the pricing in a certain way. We've got to promote it in a certain way. And if there's ever ever a sort of opportunity to take a sort of behavioural angle on anything, we'll we'll try and sort of uh, sort of crowbar it in. But but yeah, that's the the, the speakers. And as I say, it's a good mix of practicing financial advisors, which uh, some of the audience um, members prefer, or or then experts that come with a bit more sort of academic research and a bit more sort of um, sort of weight behind their sort of talks. Um, yeah, and I also try and give. Uh, sort of newer, younger type advisors, sort of a, an opportunity in a platform. Um, I don't want to give people that are sort of, you know, totally new to public speaking, but certainly if they're sort of on their on their path. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically it, really. That's great. And, and speaking of First Wealth, we had Claire Phillips from First Wealth on the show back on episode 19. So they're doing such great things. And it was a delight to have her on. And when I reached out to Anthony and we were talking and I said, hey, I'm you know committed to having 50% women on the podcast, he immediately was like, let's get Claire on. And so seeing that commitment to diversity within their organization is fantastic. So tons of great stuff going on there. And then at the event on September 8th, even though it's technically a human Women's Under Management South Africa conference, there are speakers from all over the world and being virtual, it's open to people all over the yes. world. Yes, yes, yes. Because flying international speakers to South Africa is an option, but obviously a bit more sort of punchy on the numbers as it were. But yeah, because it's virtual now, uh, this is the thing with sort of COVID and lockdown, isn't it? It's pushing people to be more innovative. I would have generally pushed back and not ever done a virtual conference. But even when we get back to maybe normal, um, I just did air quotes then. I'm, I'm aware most people can see that. Um, but yeah, when we get back to normal, um, I'll probably do a, 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 do the in-person conferences, but they might do one event a year called, you know, Hum, Hum Global that's virtual. And then it's more inclusive and I can get different speakers in and just a different type of format. Um, yeah, so it's it's good, actually. There's going to be a lot of uh, good good unintended consequences from it. Yeah, I, I know Claire, Claire well. Um, yeah, she's great. She's great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Speaking of behavioral finance, so this is still relatively new. I mean, it's been going on for a while, but it's still making its way into all the conversations. And when it first came out, I was reading a lot about it really being in relation to just the investing side, but it's expanded more than that. So kind of talk us through what is behavioral finance? I sort of struggle to answer this as well. I think I think you've asked me that because also maybe you struggle with it as well. It's a bit of a <laughs> tricky question. It's like, it is what I do and it's sort of the world I live in. Um, uh, yes. Um, so behavior is obviously how we act. You know, and becoming, you know, financially successful requires a lot of effort and it requires a lot of action. So, so in essence, that's your, your sort of behavior. And we have to sort of double down on the good behaviors and sort of halve or eliminate the bad behaviors uh, and you're right it's a relatively new discipline to the financial advice profession personal financial advice but it's been around for it's been around forever um and uh, rory sutherland said this he said you know you know daniel kahneman and tversky the sort of famous sort of professors in this space that have written loads of books and published loads of papers he basically is saying that they're just codifying what car salesmen and advertising executives have always known you know anyone who's ever been in the sales business any salesperson over the last you know millennia would have understood sorry would have been implementing the principles of you know influence behavioral economics behavioral finance um without really knowing it so i suppose in recent times we've sort of codified it um, and there's a sort of famous quote from David Ogilvy as a sort of famous advertising executive. Um, you know, people don't think how they feel. They don't say what they think and they don't do what they say. It's just, we're just a bit of a mess. Um, and human nature is, you know, has failed at most things and becoming wise is, is, is a bit of a journey. Um, so I haven't really answered what behavioral finance is. <laughs> um, but yeah, I suppose it's, focusing more on the good behaviors and trying to eliminate the bad behaviors of becoming uh you know successful whatever you deem that to be um yes there's a lot of obvious biases i think there's about something like 190 biases as humans which are generally just 
you know, chinks in the armor, glitches in the mind. Um, and I suppose the first challenge is just being, being aware of them. You know, most people don't think they're irrational. You know, most people are not reading nudge, you know, they're, they're not aware of, you know, the, the chinks in their armor. Um, so I suppose you have to just be quite inquisitive to first, um, you know, e- even realize that there's a bit of a bit of an issue. Uh, sort of Benjamin Franklin quote springs to mind here. You know, life's tragedy is that we get too old too soon and, and wise too late. Um, and yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, it is. And when you're talking about the used car salesman, I instantly started thinking about Mad Men and yeah, exactly, great show, but also using exactly. it to influence people, but maybe not in a way that we would like to have financial advisors and financial planners do. I think it's probably on the other side. So how about what does behavioral finance look like in practice? And you're a practicing advisor with your clients. It's good to pick that up on the Mad Men because they were seen as uh, almost too powerful at one stage, weren't they? The advertising yes. industry. They, they sort of had too much influence on people's behavior. They, they, they had cracked the human code. Um, but, but yeah, that's a good example of it. Um, I, I suppose also that I think there's a good book that Daniel Pink wrote, To Sell as Human. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, uh, you know, we're in a sales business. Um, you know, selling is moving people. That's what Dan- Daniel Pink says in his book. Um, you know, moving people to take good action that's going to benefit themselves. You know, uh, like any, you know, great power, it can be used for, you know, uh, good or bad as such, isn't it? Um, and yeah, with our clients, we've got to be very careful in, um, you know, saying putting clients first is, you know, just a, just a, you know, a, a super obvious statement. Um, and we can't, you know, bomb, you know, bomb out, you know, sort of bamboozle our clients with biases the minute we see them. So we've got to be very careful with how we sort of, you know, implement this into our businesses. Um, but yeah, certainly sort of pushing back, uh, you know, against client clients that are sort of wanting to take a certain action that we deem is maybe, let's say, suboptimal. Um, and uh, when it comes to uh, financial advice, obviously, we're looking after people's investing, uh, looking after their investments, looking after their life savings. So it's a very sort of big ticket item that we're looking after. Um, and the media will want to just continually derail them so we've got this constant battle of what we say to our clients in our client meetings in our client communications and then what the world tells them the rest of the time and we're only sitting with them you know 0.5 percent of their thinking time you know throughout the year so there is a big challenge that they're just sort of getting pulled from sort of pillar to post from the sort of general media and there's uh, generally three types of people in the world optimists pessimists and oblivionists Um, and two of these people Two of these uh, two of these groups can be success, su- successful investors, and that's the optimists and the oblivionists. Optimists because they're constantly, you know, seeing a sort of positive view on the world. Oblivionists because they don't really know what's going on, but they make good investing clients. Um, whereas pessimists, uh, again, they're continually looking for the next reason, uh, you know, that confirms their negative world views. Um, so again, there are quite a few clients that can't actually be saved from good financial advice because. They can't get out of their own way. Um, and I suppose as a professional advisor, you just get better at knowing the clients that you can really, really help well. You know, they have to be teachable. They have to listen to you. They have to take action. Um, and they generally have to be, you know, nice people. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, a, f- a few points I've mentioned there. I don't know if that's uh, tick, tick, tick the question. Yeah, well, and we're going to unwrap some of that here in a second. But I was just thinking kind of how does this behavioral finance fit in with all these other terms? And we've got enough struggles on the side of, you know, advisor and wealth manager and financial planner and investment advisor. And, you know, just thinking on this side, we've got behavioral finance, financial psychology, financial therapy, financial wellness. (laughs) It's kind of becoming, you're right, I can't wrap my head around it. You were struggling to wrap your head around it, but how do those all fit together? Yeah, I suppose the two big buzzwords in financial advice at the moment are behavioral coaching, you know, and I'm semi-responsible for, you know, minor amount of that. Um, Financial well-being as well. So they're the two sort of major themes I see sort of building going forward now, which they're not going away. They're not like a phasey or trendy. Um, uh, y- y- you know what I mean? They're not just like a, a hot investment idea. So they are going to be here to stay, but we just don't know how they're sort of going to sort of develop. 
We've also caused a bit of a problem in the business ourselves by using multiple words to describe what we do. It's just confusing for clients. Um, we obviously have financial advisors, financial planners, life planners, wealth managers, and there's probably a few other to mention. Whereas it's confusing for clients because most clients, you know, they just want rules of thumb, heuristics. They just want to put you in a box, don't they? They just want to yeah. say, well, sorry, I don't quite understand what you are. Um, the funny story about this is, uh, let's say someone's been banging on about what they do to their friends and family and their network. And, and they've changed over the years. They've said, oh, I was a financial advisor. Then I became a financial planner. Then I became a financial life planner. And then, and let's say they're, they're stuck on financial life planner now. And they, and a friend of theirs says, oh, I was at a barbecue at the weekend. Um, I was just talking to this guy or, or guy or girl. And, and they just sold a business for 10 million pounds. And uh, ten million dollars, whatever. And they said um, they're looking for a financial advisor, but obviously you're a financial life planner. So I, I passed them to you know a friend of mine, Sarah. She said she's a financial advisor. Uh -huh. What would they say? They go, oh no, they go, no, no. Well, sorry, what have you done? Sorry, what have you, what, no, 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 no. I'm a financial advisor. I'm a fine. Well, just freaking call yourself a financial advisor then. Make it easy for people. So. I do lots of complex financial planning with my clients. I do, you know, behavioral coaching, but I don't change my title just to suit what I'm sort of mainly focused on at that time. So I think we should just all call ourselves financial advisors. I know there's a big movement. That we should all call ourselves financial planners. Most people who call themselves financial planners and bang about financial planning on the websites can't really build financial plans. You know, the definition of are you a financial planner is a client family land in your office tomorrow morning you've got three hours to work with them you can build a financial plan from scratch and they're going to leave with a clear strategy and you're going to ha only do that by using financial planning software so if you can't use financial planning software and haven't nailed it please don't call yourself a financial planner i know a lot of the principles that you preach are sort of financial planning principles but you still need to be able to build a proper financial plan that is sort of you know tangible in digital form uh, and you can work live with a client and build what if scenarios and what happens if I invest more and what happens if we work later, you know, fluid and collaborative financial planning. And I do all of that, but I still call myself a financial advisor. So yeah, we slightly muddied the water a bit by calling ourselves financial advisors, financial planners, investment managers, life planners, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some people are quite passionate about that, but I think we should just call ourselves um, financial advisors. So back to the, yeah, we've got a few terms for this. I think the big terms are behavioral coaching and financial well-being. Um, financial wellness which again I believe are great sort of themes uh, but again we just need to if you're managing you know clients money and advising clients just stick to the you know I'm, I'm still a financial advisor and I was doing all the other things but I'm just gonna you know sprinkle in some other things uh, when, when, when I deem this to be appropriate uh, and this is a little bit like I don't know if you've heard of the, the man with the hammer syndrome or the person with the hammer sin syndrome where no. you know the person well, uh, the, to, to the man with the hammer, the world, you know, looks like a nail. So once people oh. get these things in their mind and or a, a financial well-being expert, the world is just financial well-being answers. So, you know, if anyone sits down with them and wants to talk through a problem, all they're thinking about is financial well-being. You know, like, let's say I was deep into, you know, behavioral coaching. I, I see the world as a massive behavioral coaching right. problem that I'm going to fix. Um, so again, people are, it, it, the man with the hammer is like a bias really, where they think the answer to everything is, is what is the flavor of what they're doing at the moment. Um, so there might be some of that sprinkled in that we're all guilty of. Um, yeah, whatever we're deeply passionate about, we think that is the, the answer to everyone's problems. So yeah, the, the person with the hammer problem, that might be somewhere sprinkled into here. So yeah, I think we should all keep it similar, just call ourselves financial advisors. Yes, we do investment management. Yes, we do financial planning. Yes, I'm going to help you with uh, you know uh, other parts of your life and be a coach, you know, talk things through with you, be a, be a critical friend, a strategic thinking partner. But yeah, if you start calling yourself a strategic thinking partner, when the person sells their business, they're not looking for a strategic thinking partner. They're looking for a financial advisor. Um, the other thing on that as well is uh, clients of ours, mainly the bulk of our clients will become clients when the money's in flow. And again, advisors are always saying, you know, yeah, we build financial plans. It's like, well, but they're going to become a client when the money's in flow. They've sold a the business. They've become divorced. They're about to retire. You know, they've been made redundant. Money's in flow. 
Uh, and we've still got to focus on that issue from for, for what they've come to see us with. Yes, they're going to get all the good stuff laid on and financial planning and behaviour coaching, but initially we've got to deal with the issue when the money's in flow. Um, and I have found some advisors become too evangelical about things, whereas you've just got to accept the clients that you know sort of come through our door, and it's usually when the money's in flow. That's that's the bulk of the uh, yeah re reason why people become clients. They don't really wake up and think. Oh, I'm the biggest wealth destroyer of all out of this uh, situation. I need to find a behavior coach that's going to build me a financial plan and ensure I stick to it. Um, they get that once the money's in flow and they've sort of uh, sort sort someone out. So, so yeah, that's a sort of long-winded answer to that. Well, and and with all that, one of the things you know, if everyone called themselves a financial advisor or pick any of the other terms, you know, it would yep. still be hard for clients to know. Well, what am I actually going to get with that? What does this relationship look like? And one of the things that I just love, Annie, that you say you do is helping people make unconventional and countercultural decisions. Because to me, that's <laughs> often where so much of the value comes in. It's not just the hey, you want to go through life's you know standard checklist and mark off all those items and say that you did everything right. It's kind of what makes sense for you. What's going to maybe go against the grain and the status quo. So what are some examples of how you've done that with clients? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, maybe a few points on that. Um, the biggest challenge, I suppose, is the current self versus future self. So most clients are in this, their current self frame of mind. Um, the planning mindset is quite a unique mindset. So thinking multi years ahead, decades ahead, you know, and I often say to my clients who are, let's say 40, it's like your 40 year old self is not my real client. My client is the 60 year old self that you'll become. So I'm always concerned about the future self and they're always concerned about, you know, the current self. Um, and we see um, failed 65-year-olds and we learn their story. We see successful 65-year-olds and we learn their story. Yes. And then we can help 40-year-olds um, from the principles that we know, but having heard successful stories and failed stories, we can then help them implement you know, that, that into their lives. We also help clients with trade-offs um, and... Um, I've been sort of focusing on this a little bit more of recent times. There's usually two decisions. One might maybe in a sort of an accounting decision, one sort of a lifestyle decision. And and a lot of frequently clients do what's expected of them, as you say, you know, I'm going to go to university, I'm going to get this job, I'm going to do this. You know, how many disgruntled doctors and lawyers are there out there who just become what? doctors and lawyers because their parents said, you're going to become a doctor and lawyer, a doctor and lawyer. Um, Abraham Ogunsanyo, again, a good friend of mine, he says, uh, my parents said, uh, you can be three things when you grow up. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, or a disgrace to the family. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, but it's quite a sort of poignant point that, um, that, yeah, a lot of people make decisions based on what's expected of them. So again, we help clients with trade-offs um, and we give them permission to seek um, the trade-off that might not be expected of them. And we can obviously, you know, talk, talk it through with them. Um, and again, we've just got to, get our clients to do more of the consistent behaviors that we know create wealth um you know investing more than they think you know pushing back against them when they've got sort of misconceptions around the investment markets um and just helping them just as i say do the principles that we know sort of work and consistently uh, you know doing it um, in terms of investing we explain to clients where the real returns come from i've been banging on about this for quite a while um most people like to buy new shiny things. That's why um, new shiny investments are always devised by mainly marketing companies that are sort of disguised as investment companies. Yeah. People like buying new, new things. And we say to our clients that we do things here financially with your life savings that have always worked. Anything which is working now, we avoid. And your returns are only going to come from two places, either from business, that's your own business, or if it's not your own business and you're not going to ever run your own business, then you can invest in all the other great businesses of the world, which is called the stock market. And then alternatively, the other place you're going to get your returns from is bricks, which are physical property. All of the other financial asset classes are what I call financial trash. Um, and they don't um, tick the smell test of, is this, is this a real investment? A real investment needs to do two things. It needs to provide a rising income over time, history being our guide, 
and it needs to provide rising capital value over time history being our guide and both business and bricks do that so yeah we're constantly bringing our clients back to we're doing things here which have always worked and anything which is working now we're going to avoid and we're going to put that in the this is working now bucket you know not uh, zero trading stocks uh, cryptocurrency car parks commodities coffee forestry you just you name it whatever's been devised to sell to people because they love to buy sort of shiny new things so yeah we're trying to help our clients avoid any sort of financial trash that they'll be uh, um, you know enticed to purchase yeah well so speaking of you've got a great line around humans left the factory with all of their screws loose and the screws regarding money and decision making are the final ones to be tightened, which I just love. Like <laughs> I'm a very visual person and I got such a visual out of that. But then my very next thought was something you've touched on multiple times is all of the media and marketing and messaging and the fact that that's with clients 99.5% of the year and advisors only get to be with clients, you know, half a percent of that time. So yep. what are the most effective ways to start tightening those screws? <laughs> what, is, what does that look like in terms of a successful, fully formed human? Uh, just on that as well, um, humans are not born with an expiry date. Um, and if we were, the world would be a completely different place. The whole reason why we're in business, Kate, is because humans are not born with an expiry date. Uh, and people don't know how long they're going to live, which basically means they need to take out insurance and they need to invest correctly. Um, the whole dying too soon and living too long is the whole reason why there is this personal finance investing world. Um, if people were born with an expiry date, we could tell them to the nearest you know, dollar what they could spend every day. Um, so that's quite an interesting one. It takes a while for financial advisors to realize that. The whole reason why we're in business is because people don't know when they're going to die. They don't know if they're going to die too soon or they're going to they're die too late. And that's the whole balance between insurance in the early years and investing in the later years. Um, and yeah, the other quote is uh, humans left the factory with all their screws loose, and the, which is correct. You know, we leave as <laughs> as completely useless. We come out of the, you know, the womb as completely useless. We are one of the, you know, most completely useless born infants army out of the whole of the animal world. Again, I don't, I don't know it well enough, but I don't know if you've seen like a giraffe being oh, yeah. born. It's mm-hmm. like they just pop out and it's like, oh, where have I let? Oh, I go just get on with life. Oh, there's mum. I just, <laughs> I'll just refer to her for a little bit of advice. Whereas the humans are just, are just useless. So yeah, we take many, many years to become, um, you know, uh, to stand on our own two feet, like literally and uh, sort of uh, figuratively. Um, yes, humans left the factory of all their screws loose. The ones around behavior and decision making are the final ones to be tightened. Um, and some people never tighten those screw, screws because they never you know, seek to become wise. They never seek to become literate about decision-making, investing. Um, So, um, yeah, um, you have to become a sort of lifelong learner to be to be tightening these screws. And we're blessed in the financial advice business that we're in the human nature business and we, we should be lifelong learners. You know, every interaction that we have with something new, be it, you know, philosophy, be it investing, be it, uh, marketing you know it's, it, all of these uh, learning points that we have could some in some way loosely benefit our business you know I say to my clients I read all the books so you don't have to um, and yeah it's that constant journey of trying to become wise trying to become smarter lifelong learning um, another sort of I think it's Benjamin Franklin quote he said most people die at 25 but they're they're not buried until 75 oh and when I heard that, I was thinking, what do you mean by this? He basically means most people give up at 25. They don't then seek to become wiser. And, you know, they don't try anything new. They don't challenge anything. They don't live authentic years. Um, yeah, so most people die at 25, but they're not buried until 75. That should give you a bit of a, a, bit of a kick up the arse, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, a couple of points. And I don't quite know how to answer the the you, you like that line um what can we do to tighten the screws don't quite know well you've mentioned a few books and being an avid reader so what are some of the favorite books on behavioral finance that you'd recommend to listeners yeah i've probably read most of them i um i'm an audible learner which i found out probably about the age of 
32 maybe. So I go through quite a lot of um, audio books a year, but and I retain the information. I'm one of those sort of lucky ones that can, can retain the audio information. Um, the best book about behavioral science is Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. And I know mm-hmm. quite a lot of the listeners would have probably listened to this. Um, and I can't remember the sort of strap line, but it's the sort of uh, why unusual ideas work, basically. And, and usually there's a, there's a small piece of alchemy in, in the reason for the success of the idea or product, uh, the magic inside it. Um, and it's not often obvious. Um, so again, that should be really interesting for people that are, you know, behavioral financial advisors type characters. I mean, you've got the obvious ones like Nudge, um, Daniel Crosby's written some great books, um, and Behavior Gap by Carl Richards. I suppose maybe the best book about behavioral finance has not been written yet, specifically about personal mm-hmm. financial advice. Um, a lot of them have covered a lot of areas, but they're in some ways, some of them are maybe a bit too technical and others are uh, a, bit, a bit non-practical. Um, thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, again, is a bit of a beast of a book. It's sort of a seminal text in this space. Um, I've read the bulk of them, but yeah, I'd recommend reading Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. I think that's going to be probably uh, the most useful. I mean, the behavior gap's great because it's got a lot of pictures as well, so it sort of combines yeah. uh, combines sort of two, two sort of le- learning sort of fields as such. Um, any books that you want to recommend? What's your thoughts on this space? Oh, you know, I was actually going through my Kindle this morning because um, I like, I was doing audiobooks for a while, but I kind of like, I don't know, something about the physical book. And as much as I'd always rather paper, I travel too much to carry those around. So I was yeah. actually looking this morning at some of the uh, old books and I was like, I have, to, I have to go back and read a lot of them. Thinking Fast and Slow was one of them. Um, I've got Nudge on there. Uh, there were two others. Behavior Gap is on there. I've read that actually a couple times. So. There's, there's a lot on there, but a lot more still to go. And I'll link to all of the books you mentioned in the show notes. Fantastic. Yeah. Andy, thank you. I've still got you know so much more that I'm thinking about. There's a conversation. We'll have to continue. But for now, any final thoughts? Yes. My final thoughts are um, if you're managing sort of clients and helping them as a financial advisor, and managing them their money um, market timing is way more pervasive than you we actually think I mean we all talk about market timing. you shouldn't do market timing nobody should do market timing but it's actually the killer mistake I see out there um, and it shows up sometimes really obviously sometimes hidden sometimes clothed sometimes dark bright every flavor it will show up as and it's always a massive story wrapped around market timing and as a professional advisor, you just got to get really good at calling it out. Um, I mean, 2020 has been the greatest year ever for the behavioral financial advisor. You know, misbehavior in all of its glory. Um, and it's a great time for you to sort of uh, take stock on your business, the clients that you look after, how they've reacted through it. Have they listened to you? Have they asked questions rather than made statements? Um, but yeah, market timing is way more pervasive than we as all professional advisors realize the bulk of investing mistakes will be made as a result of market timing. The bulk of your client breakups will probably be again through market timing of the clients. Um, So I think we just need to call it out uh, as we see it as market timing. Because as I say, it will be disguised as something else. And you might even be put off as a professional advisor with the story that comes wrapped around the market timing. But yeah, just be way, way more... Um, aware of market timing as I am being as well and as I say 2020 has been a great year for it Um, and is this you're saying clients trying to do market timing yeah I I, I just think it's probably the biggest investing mistake out there by an absolute country mile as I say we we confuse other mistakes by calling it something else but it would be market timing just wrapped up in maybe something else and there's always as I say a story around it um, but a load of the d- mistakes that clients make will be will be the flavor of market timing. Wow. All right. 
Well, Andy, thank you so much. And thank you for everything you're doing to put on the Humans Under Management event. Uh, links to that are in the show notes. You can just go to innovatingadvice.com forward slash H-U-M for Humans Under Management. Register for that. Uh, the early bird tickets are still available, I believe, but follow the link because those are going quickly as well. And Andy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. You're doing a superb job for promoting financial advice um, globally. Um, so yeah, very excited to see where everything goes for yourself as well. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for listening to the Innovating Advice Show. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn and shoot me a thought or two. Link to my profile is right below. Stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to hearing from you.